Happy New Year everybody! This new year starts with a very special video as you can see. I decided to react and discuss Ashikai's theories from her latest 4 videos which will bring us to discover so many new things about our world and about that. This video is part 1 of 2 and it will focus on the God of Time, the Lore of Flowers and King the Shred. Part 2 will mainly focus instead on the Traveler and on the Descenders. Since I'll summarize Ashikai's theories, if you want to be able to fully understand what we're gonna talk about, I would highly recommend you watch her videos. You can find the links in the description box. As always, both Ashikai's theories and mine are based on elements found in the game, but our deductions are not to be considered the official lore of Genshin Impact, unless they get confirmed in later updates of the game itself. Now, since the video is going to be extremely long, I should start right away. In her videos, Ashikai mentioned three different demonstrations of Estrad's power. The Sin Shades and Enkanomiya, which are snapshots of memories of living people frozen in time, which are also Leila in Disorder, so they are related to Ermansoul. The construction of the Dainichi Mikoshi, since Estoroth gave Abrax knowledge on how to build it, and the planting of the Sacred Sakura Tree in the past through Makoto's consciousness, which physically changed 500 years of Inazuman history rather than just rewriting memories like Nahida did with Rukadavata. Estoroth is also mentioned in ancient Mondstadt's history as the god of time worshipped alongside Barbados. I would add that there's also a reference to Estoroth on Dragonspine, the huge clock above Salvindagnir on one of the murals. Differently from Ashikai, I think the memories of Razor's parents at the end of the Divine Laser Fest may be similar to Stanley's soul that was carried by the wind, which was one of the ingredients of the Thousand Wind Wine. When it comes to Estoroth being the lore of flowers, although the evidence and connections Ashikai brought up are very appealing and very difficult to dismiss, I honestly don't think that the two goddesses are the same person for one single reason. The lore of flowers died thousands of years ago, while Estoroth made at least two more appearances after the god of flowers' death. 500 years ago in Kanria with Makoto and around 2000 years ago in Enkanomiya before it was sealed shut. This is my theory. Since the people of Enkanomiya needed to forget about the history before Celestia, as per agreement with Orobashi, she most likely extracted from the people those memories that needed to be forgotten and turned them into new sin shades that are reliving the last moments before leaving, and they were sealed inside Enkanomiya, which is the reason why the people of Watatsumi Island don't know anything about that specific section of history. Now, the Lord of Flowers is a survivor of the Sili race. The Sili all lost their bodies and minds or memories because of a tragedy that happened eons ago. Arama told us that the Sili should have never fallen in love with a human, otherwise tragedy would have struck them. But according to the records of Jayan, one of them fell in love with and married a traveler from afar, and the entire civilization was punished, their minds were stripped, they lost their bodies and they were cast away from the Moon Palace where they lived. The same curse was also laid upon the Traveler, who was also cursed never to be able to meet their beloved Sili ever again. Since we know that the Three Moons were still in the sky during the time of the ancient Tsurumi Island civilization, so the Envoy Age and as a consequence Salvindagnir's time, and we also know that the desert in Sumeru was created as a consequence of a celestial nail, which is important because the God of Flowers ended up in the desert when she was cast away, but we're talking about this in a second, we can deduce that the tragedy took place not long after the celestial nails were sent down on Tevat, which has always led me to believe that the Outlander who fell in love with that sea was the first heir of the kingdom among the heavens, especially because in the battle pass she is depicted in front of a lush dragon spine and she also lost her memories and suddenly believed herself to be the queen of the kingdom of darkness. Anyway, although the Lord of Flowers was a survivor of the Sili race, she was also cursed and her body was left a savaged husk, which really doesn't add up since she supposedly didn't look like the Sili we all know. We learned that she walked in the desert, her heels were worn through by the merciless gravel, and later countless beautiful Parisars began to bloom wherever she stepped. So I guess she still had a human body. Her curse reminds me of the people of Karia. Their curse affected their appearance and intelligence depending on its gravity. Hillichers look almost nothing like humans and have little to no intelligence, while the Abyss Lectors look almost like normal humans and retain their mental capabilities. Then there are also people who are known to be cursed but show almost no visible sign, like Dainsleth and I suppose Piero as well. 
the Lord of Flowers curse may have been similar to theirs. Back to the story, the Lord of Flowers walked the desert for 72 nights. From her wounds came springs that turned into rivers that created verdant gardens, from which sprouted night blue water lilies, which, like Ashikai says, are Nilopala lotuses, flowers that bloom at night. One of these flowers carried an ancient dream, a story about the Free Moon Sisters. The Free Sisters used to leave their palace at night to walk around the desert, and Nilopala lotuses used to bloom at their feet. Later, two moons shattered and disappeared, leaving one single moon sister so devastated by this event that she never left her palace ever again. After a long time, the dust of the moons finally fell on the earth, and where it landed, Nilopala Lotus has bloomed. It is very clear at this point that the moon sisters were probably silly, since both the three sisters and the Lord of Flowers are the only ones who are known to be able to generate Nilopala Lotuses just by walking. So, logic would say that the Lord of Flowers was one of the three moons, and I think she was. Now, back to Ashikai's theory, considering how the Sili walk the earth together with humans, it's very strange that only the Moon Sisters and the Lord of Flowers were able to create Nilopala Lotuses whenever they walked. Ashikai then theorized that the Four Shades may be compared to the four main Archangels, and the Sili may be compared to common angels. I honestly disagree with this, although my theory is not that different from hers. According to the angelic hierarchy proposed by Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite, the angels were split into three main spheres depending on their interaction with either God, his creation, or humans. Although we believe that the archangels are supposed to be the closest to God in this specific hierarchy, they are actually not. In the first sphere, we find the seraphim, the cherubim, and the thrones, who are angels who worship and live with God. In Tevat, I believe them to be the three shades of the Primordial One, and I say three because I still believe the fourth shade, Phanus, is the word tree that sustains the microcosm or master domain Tevat as I call it. The Seraphim help the deity maintain perfect order, which sounds a lot like the Heavenly Principles. The name Seraph comes from the Hebrew word Saraph, which means burning, just like Kanria was burning when the Heavenly Principles acted upon it. The cherubim are believed to be the ones who drive the vehicle or chariot of God, and they are described bound in the Ark, which is also named in the book Before Sun and Moon. The cherubim are also characterized by their knowledge and wisdom, and they are always ready to receive the highest gift of light. Considering how Esaroth gave knowledge to Abrax to build the Dainichi Mikoshi, a light to be used in the darkness of Enkanomiya, the cherub may be Esaroth. Lastly, the thrones are a little more complicated. They are the actual chariot of God and they are described as great wheels containing many eyes, and they carry out divine justice and maintain the cosmic harmony of all universal laws. Now this makes me think that the third and very much unknown shade, or at least their palace, may be actually hiding in plain sight. The palace in the sky that we all call Celestia. We know that Celestia moves in the sky, since in the past it was stationed above Dragonspine, while now it seems to be above Fontaine, and we also know that it granted the gods their noses, and, as Nahida said, they are the symbols of the control of the heavenly principles over Tevat and all the laws, and it grants visions to the people. You know, the many eyes of the thrones. And since the shades are living beings, yes, I still think the third shade is Paimon. Moving on, in the second sphere we found the dominations or dominions, the virtues and the powers, who are heavenly governors. Dominations regulate the duties of lower angels, virtues control the elements and assist in governing nature, and powers have the power over evil forces. In Tevat, I believe these to be the three moons. The Sili lived in a lunar palace, so they were probably under the rules of the dominations. The three sisters generated nature just by walking, just like the virtues control the elements and nature. While the powers are probably the remaining moon since it turned red during the cataclysm in Kanria. In the third sphere we have principalities, the archangels and the angels, who are closely connected with humans. This may be an extremely long shot, but hear me out, I mean, I always have a crazy theory in every video, so what's new? The angels, the lowest order of celestial beings, are most likely the common Sili, the ones we follow around, and like angels they were the guides of humanity, the divine envoys. 
The principalities are angels who protect nations or groups of people, while the seven archangels are the seven spirits of God that are also said to be the guardian angels of nations and countries, but they are concerned with politics, military, commerce, trade and so on. Would it be too crazy to think that the Gnosis, the laws of the heavenly principles, were the principalities, while the archangels were the archons? I know that you're thinking that the Archons have nothing to do with the Primordial One, but rather with the Second Throne, but is that even true? Every living being in Tevat is native to Tevat. Everything that comes from the outside is not even recognized. This means that even if the Primordial One didn't create the Archons himself, they are indirectly still his creation just like every other being of Tevat, and like a prism, they may be the light, which is the power of the Primordial One, split into seven colors, or in this case, elements. The same can be said about the seven Dragon Lords, but you'll understand what I mean in part two. Also, if we think about it, the Archons have demon names, just like Istroth, who is one of the Primordial One's shades. Now, moving forward with Ashikai's theory, briefly summarized, King the Shred can be compared to King Solomon because they both captured genie inside bottles and had them build something for them. Part of the mausoleum for King the Shred and Solomon's temple for, well, King Solomon. King the Shred's other name is al Ahmar, which was one of the seven Jinn kings listed in the Book of Wonders, and is also connected to the angel Samael, or Samiel, the same name of the wall that separates the desert from the forest of Sumeru. All three of them, King the Shred, Solomon and Samael, suffered a great folly. King the Shred and Samael rebelled to God, while Solomon worshipped a foreign goddess. Despite the seemingly obvious connection, I don't think King the Shred to be King Solomon. Apart from the temple, Solomon is mainly known for his grimoire on demonology, the Lesser Key of Solomon, which is divided into five books, one of which is the Ars Getia, and we should all be familiar with this book by now since it contains the names of 72 demons, which are the names used for the gods of Tevat. Wouldn't it be strange for King the Shred, one of those gods, to be King Solomon? Back to Ashikai's theory, King Solomon's fall from grace happened because of the foreign goddess Astarte, the Canaanite goddess of war, healing and royalty, also called Ishtar in the Akkadian language and Inanna in Mesopotamia. All three of them are depicted with a crescent moon turned upright on their heads, which associates them with the moon. But it can also be seen as horns and we know that the Lord of Flowers used to have them, at least as far as Nilu's research goes. Even if we remove the moon association, Astarte was still depicted either on a bull or wearing bull horns to emphasize her sovereignty. Astarte is also part of a trio of goddesses with Anat and Ashura, which could be indicative of the three moon sisters. If we analyze Ishtar, she can be associated with the morning and evening star, and the symbol used for the morning star, called the Star of Ishtar, is the exact same symbol that was used to represent King the Shred, but we're gonna talk about the symbol later. Lastly, Astarte's name was later added to the Ars Getia as Astaroth, which is obviously the basis for the name Astaroth. Let's start with the easiest thing first, the horns. Considering that, regardless of the angelic hierarchy, every single angel is basically the same kind of being, it would be reasonable to think that the generic Sili, the Moon Sisters and the Shades all had horns, and if you look closely, the empty husks of the Sili that we follow around do have tiny Q horns. Now, in my theory, Isteroth is not the Lord of Flowers because of her appearances after the Lord of Flowers' death. Another piece of evidence comes from the Flower of Paradise Lost artifact set. The Lord of Flowers wanted to rebel against the absurd shackles that govern this world, she was stripped of her powers of enlightenment when she and the Sili were cursed, and she also gives one last advice to King the Shred, seek not the master of the four shades. This doesn't sound like something one of the shades would do or say. Going back to King the Shred, let's talk about his connection with the angel Samael. Apart from the wall of Samael in the desert of Sumeru, in mythology both al Ahmar and Samael are kings, the former of the jinn and the latter of all demons, and they are both connected to the planet Mars and with Tuesday. Samael's name also means poison of God, and King the Shred brought to the vat what could be defined as poison. 
Samael is also considered the angel of death, and the beast is identified with is the camel that he rode. And camels live in the desert. If we dig deeper into his story, things may get a little tricky. Apart from being the reason why the serpent tempted Eve and as a consequence the cause of Adam and Eve's banishment from the Garden of Eden, Samael is merely known for being Lilith's partner or husband. I'm going to talk more in detail about Lilith in part 2, but summarized in Jewish folklore and in Kabbalistic and Gnostic beliefs, she was the first woman created by God from the soil just like Adam. Since she didn't want to submit to Adam because they were equal, she fled to the earth, where she found the fallen angels with which she slept, producing hordes of demons. In some accounts, the angel Samael is sometimes interchanged with the king of all demons, Asmodeus, who was also in a relationship with a Lilith, a different one though, who was called Lesser Lilith. Now this Lesser Lilith may be a better candidate for the Lord of Flowers, also considering that both Asmodeus and Lesser Lilith were destined to be killed by the hands of God, just like the Lord of Flowers and King Tashret died because of forbidden knowledge. Now it's time for my own theory, albeit an extremely long shot, such a long shot that even Macrasia's theory so far would seem credible in comparison. We learn that the Lord of Flowers realized that her fate was the key to opening a mysterious doorway, and the only mysterious doorway we really know is the one in the heavens that we use to get to Tevat every time we start the game, which is also the doorway that the Traveler twins use to try and flee from Tevat. We also learn that the Lord of Flowers gave King the Shred forbidden knowledge, which she defined both as higher knowledge and as everything there is to know about the skies and the abyss. In doing so, the Lord of Flowers sacrificed herself so that King the Shred could achieve his deepest ambitions. Since her fate was the key to that doorway, her death probably opened that doorway, which may have summoned either Istaroth or, better yet, her forbidden knowledge to Tevat straight through the Lord of Flowers and into King the Shred. Now is the time to talk about the Star of Ishtar. The symbol, like Ashikai said, can be found on the chest of the Abyss Lectors, the Dark Serpent Knights, on the military uniforms of the Karian soldiers like Kafdan, it's the Adventurer's Guild logo, and later in the video she found the same symbol in Mona's charged attack, together with a crescent moon. I could add that the symbol is also present alone on Mona's chest, hands and earrings, and with a crescent moon on one of her legs and hat. We can find the Star of Ishtar on Albedo's clothes and in his constellation. It's also present on Kaya's clothes and it appeared when the Traveler was experiencing the strange headache after the Shogun defeated Signora, but also on many different types of ruined machines, Sandrone's ring guard included, and on the Festering Desire. A similar symbol can be strangely found on Capitano's mask, but if it turns out to be Menokias, it could make sense since it could be something Piero made to control him, and on Arlecchino's neck and her earrings. But I guess, and honestly I hope, they are just similar but unrelated symbols, otherwise the whole thing would get even more complicated. Although it seems to be a Canria related symbol, I actually think it's simply related to the Primordial One. Think about it, we know that Canria was most likely built on some ruins of the Primordial Unified Nation, since its architecture is the same as in Kanomiya and the upside down city in the chasm. The people of Canria probably just found that symbol among the ruins and used it for their nation. Now, if the Star of Ishtar is related to the Primordial One, could it be that King the Shred was depicted with this symbol simply because he became the vessel or the embodiment of forbidden knowledge, the knowledge of the Primordial One? Moving on, when it comes to Ashikai's theory about hydromancy, things are very, very different. Ashikai noticed that water is heavily associated with the Lord of Flowers, since rivers sprang from her feet, her domain was an eternal oasis, water flowed from her sleeves, and she was also the goddess of prophecies. Going back to Mona's charge attack and the Star of Ishtar with a crescent moon, we could push this a little further. If we were to think, like I said before, that the Star of Ishtar represents the Primordial One, his shades, their knowledge, or at least their power, what we see in Mona's attack would be the primordial being among the stars, standing over a big star, maybe the morning star or just the sun, standing over the moon, 
standing over the bat. And I say Tavad because that symbol is way too similar to my idea of the master domain Tavad, an inhabitable half sphere and the abyss in the other half. Notice also the tiny star at the end of the abyss where the Tavad's gate or doorway is supposed to be. Let's talk about the scry glass now. My translation is very different from the one Ashika used, and if you've seen my videos, you know that I studied Latin for 8 years through middle to high school, so I'm familiar with the language and I can translate it on my own. The text on the scryglass reads Ex culmine lucis in magno elementorum lux se fundat in mentes dei, which I translated as From the pinnacle of the light as the great one of the elements made the light surrender to God's minds. And yes, minds is plural because I believe it's talking about its shades, who are essentially copies of the primordial one. Part of this spell is also found on the seal attack of some hypostasis, but it just says from the pinnacle of the light as the great one of the elements. Then we also have a modified and longer version of this invocation or spell in the Abyss Lector Violet Lightning's Grimoire, which says I am the destiny of the Abyss, hence I purify from the pinnacle of the light as the great one of the darkness. May the light surrender to the minds for or in favor of the Abyss. Now the most exciting discovery I made comes with what Ashikai discovered. The seemingly random letters in the bigger section of the scryglass actually have a meaning and, in retrospect, it would have been really easy to figure out if I paid more attention. GBL, URL, MKL, RPL, which are the names of the four main archangels, Gabriel, Uriel, Michael and Raphael. Now what's my take on this? Well, a few minutes ago I said that the seven archangels may actually be the seven archons of Tevat, but we can definitely push that concept a bit further. The difference between the archons and the angels is that the angels are unique and immoral, while the archons can die and be substituted. So what actually defines a nation in Tevat? The elements. They are assigned to the seven and, if one of the gods dies, the element of the next god is still the same. The elements of Tevat are Pyro, Animo, Hydro, Geo, Cryo, Electro and Dendro. Of these elements, four are primary and three can be described as derivates. Earth, air, fire and water are the four elements believed to be essential in life, and they also represent the four states of matter, solid, liquid, gas and plasma. Water and wind may produce ice, water and earth may produce dendro, while electricity, I honestly don't really know, but considering how ancient civilizations didn't even understand what electricity was, most of the time it was considered a form of fire, so maybe air and fire? Anyway, the four archangels from the scryglass are also believed to be in charge of the four elements in nature. Raphael represents air, Michael fire, Gabriel water and Uriel earth. The same elements are also connected to the four directions. East is air, south is fire, west is water and north is earth. Ashikai found a bedtime prayer that says To my right, Michael, and to my left, Gabriel. In front of me, Uriel, and behind me, Raphael. And over my head, God's presence through his Holy Spirit which puts the archangels, cardinal points and elements in different positions. But, and there's a huge but here, if you've read the manga or if you've watched my random theories video, to seal the evil power inside Kale, Saino used what we know as the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram on her. By the way, just saying, the star of Ishtar is here as well. Sino performs the second step of the ritual, called the formulation of the pentagrams, which begins in the east and invokes or vibrates the name of God, in this case, Yahweh in the east representing air, Adonai in the south representing fire, Eheye in the west representing water, and Agla in the north representing earth. The third step of the ritual, though, is called the evocation of the archangels. And again, starting from the east but in a different order, the person performing the ritual invokes Raphael, so air, then Gabriel in the west, water, Michael in the south, fire, and Uriel in the north, earth. And what exists above the elements, the cardinal points and the archangels? God, which is represented by light. 
the light that needs to surrender to God's minds in Mona's cry glass, or maybe the light that is better represented by a bright star, like the star of Ishtar. And that's it for now. I really hope you liked this video and that I was able to transmit the excitement I felt when I was doing my research. Part 2 will be up hopefully next week, so I'll start working on the final script and on the video right away. Don't forget to check Ashika's videos and channel and leave her a like and subscribe. If for whatever reason you don't know her, trust me, her videos will blow your minds. As always, if you like this video, don't forget to leave a thumbs up, and if you like Genshin Impact Theory videos, consider subscribing. Until next time, over and out.